Hey there, this is Pete Townsend from Norio Ventures. Welcome to Money Never Sleeps, a podcast that looks inside the head of entrepreneurs and at what makes them do what they do. This episode of Money Never Sleeps is kindly sponsored by Ireland's fintech and financial services recruitment specialist, Top Tier Recruitment. If you or a colleague need help attracting and retaining great talent for your fintech or financial services company, it is highly advisable that you build a relationship with the team at Top Tier Recruitment. You can find them at toptierrecruitment.com and tell them we sent you. This week, we're catching up with David Krang, a partner with Lead Block Partners, a London-based venture capital fund investing in early-stage B2B blockchain startups. David and I connected at a conference last month in London, and after hearing about his first investment with Leadblock, I wanted to know more, especially given that Leadblock venture outside of financial services with their blockchain-themed investments. Given where I've been spending my time of late, I'm nearly at the saturation point of talking about blockchain-inspired and distributed ledger technology propositions in financial services, As I said last week in our first Money Never Sleeps blog post on Medium, we'll know that blockchain has gone mainstream when we stop talking about blockchain. So let's take a different look at blockchain than what I've been talking about for the last five years with David Krang on this week's episode of Money Never Sleeps. Money Never Sleeps, pal. Here we go again. Welcome to Money Never Sleeps. We're recording today from the home studio. We're on with David Krang partner at Leadblock Partners, a London-based venture capital fund investing in early-stage enterprise blockchain startups. Welcome to the show, David. Hi. Hi, Pete. Excellent. Great to have you on. Working away from home today, which is is a good thing. Um, Just for all our listeners out there, we're recording this on the 11th of March, where the world has gone viral uh, in such a way with coronavirus that everybody's kind of taking action and doing things a little bit differently than the way they're used to, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been traveling a lot to to Paris, you know, where we have, uh, you know, our an an another remote office. So we're juggling, you know, between London and Paris. So we actually see the the major difference, you know, in behavior changes, you know, what's happening with coronavirus and the skepticism that that, that started to uh, to hit also markets as of today. Yeah, absolutely. I just saw the the, the craziness in the markets on Monday morning, um, and then which was two days ago, and then the the, the rebounds over the the last couple of days and. It's like there's just so much systematic trading going on out there in the market yeah. that um, if systematic trading was where it was today when we had the SARS scare 20 years ago, it'd be a, it'd be a much different thing. Yeah, absolutely. Fully agreed on that. Right. Cool. So let's um, – just from the perspective of our listeners, you and I met – uh, would have been about a month ago now yeah. when we were both in London for the Securities Token Realize Summit. Obviously, you were in London. I was visiting London from Dublin. Um, and we got to talking about a few different things. So I was really interested because of how deep I've gone into the blockchain-inspired or distributed ledger technology space within financial services um, and learning about what you guys are doing at LeadBlock, um, your first investment. I'm just really interested to hear about another side of blockchain um, and your perspectives on that from a venture capital and investing perspective or just your own specific personal interest. Uh, but let's start with your backstory, how you got to this point and what you're doing right now. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, if, if you know, to, to understand a bit more why and when it all started, you know, at Leadbot Partners, we need to go back a couple of years ago when, when our senior partner, Jean-Marc Puel, invested into a startup developing sensors for the, for the food industry. And that this is actually when we started to discuss blockchain and distributed ledger technology as a, as a means to secure data. So, you know, shortly after, we started to have a lot of discussions with corporate executives across a lot of sectors. And what we realized is, you know, in, in, in a big data environment, it is actually becoming an, an imperative to collect, to secure, and to create value from, 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 from data. And, you know, on, 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 its, on, on the same topic, when you're looking at top-line revenue for those large corporates, you see that growth is slowing down for various reasons, including, you know, deceleration of global economic growth, as you see today. So that is putting a lot of pressure on those corporates in terms of margins. And those guys are actively looking to, to digitize their processes, to leverage data, to automate as well. And this is, you know, a great way of, of cutting costs. So that, that's how it all started, you know, around this thematic of big data, digitization, automation need, going into this environment where, you know, Big data is going to become a major part of 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 of, of their business. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And, and just looking at your kind of background, uh, a lot of folks know I, I do deep dives into LinkedIn um, to see where people are coming from. And generally, just by looking at their profile and seeing their job experiences and their educational background, I kind of get a good feel for them. And obviously, you and I already met, so I kind of knew where you were coming <laughs> from. But but just looking at it from you know your educational and research background in mathematics and biophysics, obviously, that kind of set the tone for a lot of the things that you've worked on over the last eight or nine years, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if, if you're looking a little bit at you know what, what, what I've done you know, prior to launching the, the the fund, I was I was I was actually working you know covering the energy space at, at, at Goldman, and that was quite interesting because you know covering those large like so those large corporates in the energy space, you realize that there's this real need you know for for innovation, but you know you got a lot of strategic focus as of today. I mean, you've seen on Monday the massive drop in oil price, so people have priorities. Innovation and tech is surely one, but so far, you know, that wasn't needed to be able to leverage all the data that they had to be able to automate and optimize processes. And, and I think that as we move through in a time where oil price remains low, where global economic growth is going to, 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 to slow down at single digits, I think that corporates are going to start to, to, to put more attention and more priorities towards technology and leveraging that to be able to, uh, you know, reduce costs and you know, optimize some of the processes. Yeah, it, it is a big commitment. And you, you see things happening in the banking sector um, with, uh, obviously with Goldman Sachs, where, where you spent five years and their move away, not a move away from, but them complementing their business with different types of financial services activities on the retail side, um, becoming more digital and it, technology obviously enabling them to do that. And people don't tend to think too much about what are the other types of things that big financial services players could get into if they are, you know, becoming and have become more technology focused. And I kind of saw one of the notes on your on your LinkedIn profile on your thematic work on low carbon when you were an energy equity analyst at Goldman Sachs. T- tell me a bit about that. I mean, what what, what was important, you know, is if you look at the past couple of years, I mean, that, that there is a huge, you know interest and push from consumers for the energy transition. And that, that is also a push that governments are making, but you see a lot more pressure from investors towards the large corporates in the energy space to think about the next step. So what I was doing here at, at, at Goldman was you know, to better understand what was the rationale and the strategic focus that big oils had, which we call them today as big energy, because Essentially, if you're looking at the past years, the focus for them was to explore, find resources, extract them, and sell them to the consumer. That was mainly oil and gas. Today, yeah. we're moving into an environment that is getting more electrified with more electric vehicles. I mean, you can see it in London as well. You see a lot more you know, initiatives from the cabs, from the charging. So you see that, that the movement where Today, energy is not only oil and gas, it is electricity from from the consumer. So for us, in this specific piece on low carbon, we wanted to to better understand, but also, you know, make a big statement on, you know, big energies are actually taking steps to be able to transition from, you know, being only oil and gas explorers, producers, and sellers to electricity producers as well. So okay. when you're looking at that trend, that helps a lot on the debate around climate change, GHG emissions, and, and, and was something that, 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 that was quite critical uh, uh, for, for us in the team. Okay. So almost going bigger and saying that, listen, I, I was an oil company or I was an energy company focused Absolutely. on oil, but now I'm an energy company. And what type of energy must we produce? And obviously, there is a huge part of historical society that is and will remain dependent upon Absolutely. fossil fuels. But um, there are alternative ways to produce energy that technology is enabling to be faster, better, and cheaper, right? Yep. So let's focus on that. That's really interesting. I kind of, you know, in, in looking at it, your background as well, David, and seeing you know, your move to lead block and your first investment and just, you know, kind of the bridge really being taking action now to set the tone for how business and society interact for the next hundred years, really. Um, 
and you, and you look at some of the things going on out there in the industry now and say, well, these look like small drops in the ocean, yeah. right? But you need a lot of those. And these things are already happening around the world. You know, folks like you guys are, are driving some investment into this and obviously making making it possible. Tell me about, just to dig right into the topic, the applicability of blockchain and distributed ledger technology to sustainability, really, um, looking at it from a, a bit of a wider lens. Yeah, of course. I mean, on, on, on that front, that, that, that is something that is quite interesting and important as well, because distributed ledger technology by nature, you know, given its benefits of immutability, decentralization, auditability, or automation, that technology has the potential to transform and also reshape how people rethink how businesses are run to make them more equitable and transparent. But in, 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 in our view, a DLT or a blockchain you know, will have to be combined with other types of technologies of deep tech, such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, or sensors to actually serve a purpose. So, I mean, there, there, there are two things that you know, we can speak about here. The first one being you know, the, the, the power back to the consumer. So DLT can help consumers also have and make better informed purchasing decisions. And that also can allow them to favor and reward sustainable practices, for instance, in the food industry. So if you're just looking at some stats, for instance, at, at the global level, environmental impact is a buying consideration for 70% of consumers. And okay. the use of high quality ingredients is, is critical for 80% of them. But today, you know, consumers like yourself or myself are struggling to have visibility and trust in the environment and impact and also production practices of those brands, of those producers, effectively. So that is something that, that, that is actually top of mind for consumers. The second one, you know, following up that, that point is to incentivize sustainable behaviors. You know, again, DLT can be a great tool to re for reward mechanism, gamifications or, you know, interest alignments between communities and organizations. And, you know, one way to illustrate this, for instance, is, is our investment in, in connecting food because... You know, the, 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 the startup is actually donating 5% of their turnover to farmers and growers to incentivize and reward them. Because if you're looking at this industry, farmers and growers are actually at the earth of, of food quality and sustainable practices can sometimes, you know, incur additional costs and that can put pressure, you know, on those guys. So what we see is technology here can become an enabler to a fairer and more sustainable way of, of, of doing business. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We, my wife switched this over, Dave, it's all organic probably about seven or eight years ago. And as you know, based here in Dublin, but there's a farm out in Galway on the West coast of Ireland mm -hmm. that run a complete organic farm called Green Earth Organics. Um, and buying that box of vegetables or three boxes of vegetables and fruit from them each week, that gets expensive, not yeah. only for us, mm -hmm. but for them to produce as well. You know, not using not using um, the pesticides means that they're down on their hands and knees, yeah. weeding the all of the you know all the rows and rows and rows of, um, and that is not a cheap way to produce food. No, absolutely. Right? So um, the, it's definitely a more costly side of it, but um, absolutely I agree on the. Um, not only is it the applicability of things like distributed ledger technology, but also artificial intelligence, machine learning, Internet of Things, yeah. all of that kind of needs to fit together. Right, it does fit together, um, but it it you can't just use one uh, in isolation in order to really make a difference here on um, how you are delivering uh, these types of products to society. Right? No, absolutely, and, and you know, like the the, the 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 way I see things as well is that you know we we shouldn't start from the technical from the technology angle. We should think about you know what are the challenges that consumers corporates are currently facing. Make sure we understand them and then think about ways to be able to solve and deliver a solution you know, that helps you know, solve those issues. And technology is one part of the toolkit that we can use to solve that. But you yeah. know, experience from the industry is also critical because some of those industries are really complex, talking about the healthcare sector, for instance, or the aerospace and defense. And without that understanding of the industry, Understanding, you know, the language, how it works, the operational processes, it becomes very difficult, you know, for a techie to come in and say, I have a groundbreaking solution to solve your problem without properly understanding what's happening beneath. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, and I think that, 
you know, the there is the over use of the word blockchain, right? When it comes to a number of different things happening Absolutely. out there in the world today, um, with people to- just kind of throwing it into this bucket of buzzwords around um, <laughs> emerging technologies or, or those things that are already going live in different pockets of the world, right? You know, it, it is, can you actually solve the problem? And some, some of the best value propositions I see, uh, you don't even hear about blockchain or distributed ledger technology Absolutely. until you get into their into the deep dive around their their infrastructure and their tech stack, right? So if you kind of think about the differences between blockchain and distributed ledger technology applicability to uh, financial services versus that of sustainability, I know that mm-hmm. in general, you guys are looking across the scope in terms of what are some problems that people are solving with uh, with these technologies. In terms of how that tech is applied to financial services versus sustainability, what, is, what are some of the key differences? Yeah. I mean, I, I think before digging into the differences between those, you know, the applicability of the ATs across various industries, especially financial services relative to other sectors, it's quite important, you know, for the listeners to, to, to get some context around the blockchain and the DLT ecosystem. So, you know, yeah. if, if, if we start from the beginning, we can split the evolution of that ecosystem into three concrete, you know, technology layer. The, the base layer, which is the protocol layer, effectively, on which all the other elements are run, for instance, you know, the Bitcoin, Ethereum protocol, Hype Ledger, Corda on the other side. You got also a second layer, which is the infrastructure layer. And this one facilitates all the interaction and, the, and this enables the use of the protocols. This is namely, you know, like the wallet producers, chain explorers, etc. And finally, the third layer, the application one, is where enterprise solutions are being developed and where they're operated. So, you know, the yep. application is across sectors, energy, supply chain, mobility, healthcare compliance, you name it. But when you're looking at the development of those three layers, the first period between 2009 to 15, mostly and up to today, was mainly focusing on the first two layers. And that was natural because that was required to increase adoption and to build application. And that's quite similar to what we've seen you know, in, the, in the early 80s for the internet, where the protocol layer that was the TCP IP, the Internet Protocol Suite, was the base layer on which yeah. other elements were run. And soon after, a lot of other applications started to emerge across sectors, setting up you know, the internet ecosystem as we all know it today. So that was what I call, you know, the digital asset wave. The second wave, which is the enterprise solutions wave. Since 2015, you're seeing a larger share of startups that are developing blockchain type of solutions for corporates. And that is, you know, the wave that we are looking at effectively on the application side. So if, you know, if you want to go back effectively at the main differences in terms of technical abilities, so if you're looking at a couple of years ago, we started to see, as I said, you know, to see a material pickup in terms of enterprise blockchain solution. But you also started to see from 2015 a material pickup of interest from large corporates in different in- industries, including in food, in healthcare, in real estate. So on the more technical side, privacy was number one as an important point because most of the protocols that were developed before were public blockchains. Yeah. Another challenge that public blockchain were facing at that time was scalability. You know, everybody keeps on talking about the number of transactions per second. And that was critical, especially in financial services that runs millions of transactions. This is not necessarily the case for industry corporates, you know, in healthcare or food, for instance. And finally, the last point I see is, you know, we, we briefly spoke about it, but DLT for the industry outside of financial services is only a piece of the equation for corporates to be able to optimize and automate some of their processes. And, and, and what I see, you know, the DLT by itself is only a sophisticated database. I don't think that is enough. We need to cooperate, you know, with algorithms, with AI, with sensors to, to turn corporate's data management toolkit more powerful. So yeah. that is something that, 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 that is quite important to distinguish, you know, between what is happening in the financial services area, you know, post-launch of the Bitcoin you know, cryptocurrency and protocol after the financial crisis that was to answer and fulfill some of the need in the financial services industry, including your own trust. And, you know, at that time, that, that has led to the birth and the fast growth of the fintech ecosystem. But this is actually to reshape how financial services industry is run. So the entire ecosystem that we saw since 2010 
on the crypto and digital asset side, financial services, it was to also to facilitate the transfer and the use of cryptocurrencies. But on the other side, when we're looking at enterprise solution, it is not to reshape how things are done, it is to be able to optimize and improve processes to make it more you know, efficient, allow them to reduce costs, bring more security, trust, you know, and auditability. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. And it, it, there's just, there's a lot of conflation out there in the industry. I, I shifted to using the term blockchain inspired at, a couple months ago, just to avoid these types of conversations where you're talking with someone for about 10 minutes and they mean the Bitcoin blockchain and you mean distributed ledger technology, Absolutely. Right? Which, which are two different things. Just kind of shifting over to the people side of things a bit, David, when, yep. when you think about you know, the, the founders that you're out there meeting that fit your thesis, right, with lead block. Talk about some of the traits that you're looking for in the founders that you're meeting. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, like, when, at, at, at the stage of, the, you know, of development of the startup that we're looking at, which is early stage, you know, the, the team behind the startup is often the, the, the more important piece, even than the idea of the product itself. So for us, it is absolutely critical that the founders have the right skill of set, drive, but also the experience to be able to successfully manage and grow the business. So for us, you know, one of the founders must have a prior experience in the underlying industry on the operational side. And usually those guys are partnering with an experienced tech professional to be able to avoid you know, any end of IT outsourcing at this stage. So the, 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 the interesting metrics that, that, that we've collected, you know, by speaking to, to, to hundreds you know, of, 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 of founders, seeing you know, like a lot of, of deck was that on average for the most promising and interesting project, you see that the experience of, the, of, of, of one founder is on average around 15 to 20 years. So this is for me like a, a new class of yeah. entrepreneurs which are not you know, coming out of school with a great idea, which is fine as well on the B2C side, but on the B2B side, it's always more powerful to have somebody that I've lived through you know, um, the, the experience of working in large corporates on the operational side that have experienced a lot of difficulties there and actually think today, well, I think uh, I have an idea. I, I understand the mechanics. Things can be improved that can benefit the corporate, but also the industry. Why not partnering with, a, you know, with an IT professional to be able to implement that and solve that, 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 those, those challenges? So that, that is something that's quite important for us, you know, the, the prior experience. But, you know, the final point that I'll say, I, I often you know, compare as well the, the relationship between a startup and, and an early stage VC as, as, as a marriage. You know, you got a lot of ups, you got a lot of downs. And I think there was a study that was made that on average, you know, it, it tends to last around 10 years. So it, it's something that is quite important, you know, especially at this stage of, of development. That's, that's not something that should be, you know, taken, you know, uh, easily. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, they say the perfect age for an entrepreneur is somewhere in the mid 40s, right? Uh, and especially looking at this from a B2B perspective. And uh, do, do you think, you know, in terms of having that firsthand experience with the problem you're solving, do you think your five years as an, an energy equity analyst, right? Do you think that gave you that deep insight into the problems that need to be solved? Well, I've, 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 I think there's always, you know, room for to, 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 to learn. But, you know, when, when you're in those large institutions that are, you know, fast-paced, we talk to a lot of, of clients, you know, on the as asset managers, hedge fund managers, of equities, et cetera, you know, you tend to always and constantly you know, push yourself to learn more, to better understand, you know, your corporates, the companies that you cover, but also the industry as a whole. So, so, so I think that as long as you have, you know, this, this baseline of knowledge, of relationship, of network that you've built, and also, you know, the energy space, the energy transition, but also healthcare are sectors that, you know, I'm deeply passionate about. That is something that's quite important, which means that you don't do it only for work. You do it because you enjoy it. You want to make a change, but also you do it outside of work because that's something that is embedded into who you are. So for me, that, that's a lot more important than only counting the number of years. In, in, in the founder's case, it just happened that mathematically speaking, when we're making the average, we get around you know, 17 years of professional experience. That is great. But if we get somebody who spent 
10 years, for instance, versus somebody who spent 30 years, the person that spent 30 years doesn't actually mean that he has a better understanding than the other person. You know, it's all relative regarding the, the amount of hours that you spend, the drive that you have as well. So that, does, that is something that's quite important to us. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's getting deep into it, right? And it's saying, like the Collison brothers from Ireland that, you know, were the founders of Stripe, you know, they were, what, 2021 20, when they started that business. And yeah. did they have deep B2B experience? No. Were they solving yeah. a B2B problem? Yes. Just because they had this profound understanding of technology and this drive to simplify things. Absolutely. Um, it can make things challenging from a founder perspective, I think, when a VC looks at them and kind of says, well, do you fit the profile, you know, in terms of, you know, looking like Mark Zuckerberg, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and and having that same mentality and, and view on the world. Uh, but it's a much different thing when you're talking to people who have lived in an industry and had that first hand deep, deep, deep experience with the problem that they're solving. It's, it can be night and day when it comes to those types of things. And um, people talk about pattern matching with founders and, and any interesting insight into that at all in terms of, you know, some of the, some of the traits beyond just what you're looking for in terms of their experience, but, you know, in terms of their own personality, what are some of the things that, that stand out to you? I mean, for 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 for, for, for us, you know, at, at Leadbrook as well, you know, of of course, the the experience, the underlying experience of, of one of the founders is critical. But you know, it's at this stage of development, you know, people is, is key. You know, the the product is prone to change. You're going to pivot your business model. There's there's a lot of challenges that you, that you're going to face. The, the the big question, you know, is to understand first of all, you know, does this founder have the shoulder to take on board this kind of growth and business, but also is there any synergies between the founder and the VC that will make the business bigger? Uh, and that's something that, that is quite important. But pattern matching, if you're looking at different criteria, I mean, you, you can find research studies that prove that, you know, as you're mentioning, a certain number of experience is ideal for a founder to succeed, etc. But there's going, there's always going to be some exceptions, and you don't want to miss out on those exceptions because it can happen that those exceptions turn out to be extraordinary. So I, I wouldn't limit, limit myself to certain criteria. Criteria and standards are here to help to provide a structure, but when you see somebody that doesn't fit that structure, we always spend the time you know, to better understand you know what's their vision longer term, what's their drive. What, what are they passionate about and what's the understanding? And, and that's how we make, you know, the, the business decision on, on, on whether to invest or not. Yeah, yeah, I totally get that. Passion can be quite important. Tell us about, tell us a bit more about connecting food as your first investment, right? And um, this is important to me, like I said before, because, you know, my wife switches over to organic yeah. um, a number of years ago and anybody can just rock up and put a stamp on a can of Heinz baked beans and say mm -hmm. that it's organic, right? And yeah. we actually do buy organic Heinz baked beans in my house, right? right. So, <laughs> um, it, you know, three young kids, we go through a lot of beans and, um, you know, there, there's a longer bean story to my childhood that we'll, I'll tell you more about the next time we meet David. Um, but, you know, with regards to the investment decision you made there, is there anything that you can share about what were some of the key factors that went into your decision to make that investment? No, of course. I mean, so so as as, as you mentioned, you know, our, our first portfolio investment was in connecting food. So we led the uh, two point one uh, euros, million euros pre Series A round, and, and we're going to join the, the the board. So just just a quick background of who connecting food is. So the the, the startup was what was created back in twenty sixteen by, by by two founders, Maxine Roper and, and Stefano Volpi, and, and they both worked more than twenty years in the food industry. So. You know, they, they were facing in their respective role a number of challenges, including, you know, upstream traceability and, uh, and audit in terms of quality. So what Connecting Food is doing is building consumer trust in food by not only, you know, tracking, but they're also digitally auditing products in real time by leveraging DLT. So what this enables, it, it allows producers, brands, retailers to actually prove to their consumer, to their customers that each product really respect the commitment, the specification, and the practices listed on the labels. So the benefit is actually to protect the brand equity. It reduces also food waste, but also it, it allows you know, to, re, to reward sustainable practices. You know, the, the thing that we mentioned, 
where connecting food is donating 5% of the turnover to, to farmers and growers to be able to incentivize and reward those kind of practices. But, you know, to, to, to go back and, and, you know, understand a bit more our rationale in, into this industry, um, we've done a lot of work in, in the food industry. And, you know, as I mentioned early in this podcast was Jean-Marc, our senior partner, invested in a, in a style that we're developing sensors for the, for the food industry. So we started to look a lot around this thematic because that was something also quite critical for, for us. And yeah. we've identified your know, four big challenges within the food industry. So, so the first one is that consumers are actually lacking trust in brands and retailers. And, you know, if you're looking at the Food Market Institute uh, research, there's only one third of consumer that are trusting food brands, which is extremely low. And, 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 and you know, three fourths of them say that they would actually switch from one brand to the other if they, if, if they have more in-depth information about it. So that's something okay. that's quite important. So consumer trust actually faded away a couple of years ago because if you're looking at the past two decades, you can list a large amount of food safety, food scandals, including the 2013 horse meat scandal in Europe, the E. coli yep. lettuce scandal in, in the US and in the UK, or more recently, you know, last year, the, the sick cow meat scandal in, in Poland. So that's something that impacted consumer stress. The, the second big challenge was product recalls. So basically, those are costly. They are leading to food waste, but also financial and brand damages. So that, that is something that is quite, you know, at the core of what brands are looking to protect themselves. The third one is that food auditors today, of the like of Lloyd Register, Bureau of Veritas, on the food audit side, they are finding it hard to follow the market growth. Because, as you mentioned, you know, consumers are asking for more transparency. They're asking for more traceability, but also for quality. And the issue is that when you got demand emerging for the entire supply chain, so consumers, retailers, brand producers, it is actually very difficult for an industry that have a bottleneck on human capital. So for instance, an egg auditor do not have the capability to audit um, a beef uh, a beef farm, for instance. So yeah. and that's actually leaving less than 5% of the food production volumes today being audited. And the final point, so it's, 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 it's the last one, but not the least important, actually, you know, is the one that we we're mentioning on farmers and growers being at the, you know, at the heart of, uh, of, of food quality. And, you know, like those sustainable practices are incurring additional costs and putting more pressure on those guys. So we have to find a way, you know, to make it more profitable and more equitable, you know, to, to, to actually incentivize those kind of practices. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. It all brings it right back to square one, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, David, we've covered a lot over the last half hour or so. Um, and before we, before we close up, do you maybe want to just tell us one thing that people wouldn't expect to know about you? Yeah, I mean, like what, what, one thing usually like, people are quite surprised to hear about is my uh, engineering background because I took a major in uh, computational chemistry. So like what, one of the research projects I was working on more than 10 years ago was to, 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 to use quantum mechanics to model the DNA structure. And you know, on this specific healthcare theme as well, I've, I've worked a lot on, in, in biophysics research lab of, of one of my lectures. And I actually received two, two bursaries to finance those research projects to study the, the physical properties of phospholipids and, and triglycerides. So that, that, that was quite technical wow. at the time. I was in labs wearing the coat, you know, the goggles and everything else and switched completely on, 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 on the other side. But I, I'm, I'm still looking and actively at, at the space and something that, that I'm quite involved in as well. We need to talk about triglycerides. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's another story for another day. But uh, yeah, I, I have some personal interest in triglycerides in the last number of years. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I won't get into it. That's amazing. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, your, your background as an engineer means that you are at heart a problem solver, right? Well, hopefully. I hope so. Yeah. I mean, that, 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 that is a drive as well. Is, uh, we, the, the, the reason why, you know, Myself and also my colleagues decided to, to, to go into the, the, the theme is that we believe, we deeply believe that this technology can be, you know, a game changer in various ways, you know, in, in, in research, for instance, in clinical trials, you know, like leveraging data, you know, data is often missing, is often lacking. So we think that technology could be an enabler there as well for the industry through our investments. So, I mean, our, our understanding and what we, what we believed in and what we experienced were the main driver of assessing different tools to be able to have an impact there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think longer term, 
you know, uh, making the world a better place through, you know, our own passions and doing business each day the way that we like to do it. I mean, it's a great, uh, it's a great way to go through life, you know, so awesome to hear all about this, David. And, you know, looking forward to our next meet in London, hopefully, or sometime you're over here in Dublin, once we get this coronavirus all behind Absolutely. us. Yeah, likewise. And, uh, and, and we can have that chat about triglycerides, perhaps over a pint of Guinness one of these days. For, for, for sure. We, we, we have a pleasure. Thanks, Pete, for, okay. for inviting me here. It's, uh, it's been great. Thank you, David. Thank you. Money never sleeps, pal. That does it for this week, folks. And thanks to David for opening up his mind to help us figure out why he does what he does. Links and show notes for this episode and all of them are on moneyneversleeps.ie, so check us out online. Remember, if you or a colleague need help attracting and retaining great talent for your fintech or financial services company, it is highly advisable that you build a relationship with the team at Top Tier Recruitment as they really know their stuff. You can find them at toptierrecruitment.com. Also, thanks to Conan Brophy from Create Sound for editing this podcast. As for me, I increase the odds of startup success. Get in touch through the contact page on norioventures.com, and you can check out what Owen Fitzgerald is up to these days on Twitter at Owen Fitzgerald9. Finally, till next time, thanks for listening. See ya! Money never sleeps, pal.